Well, without further ado, I want to introduce my friend Nick Phillips. Nick is a, uh, a VP of A&R at Concord Records, which in the last few years has become one of the largest, if not the largest, independent record company in the country. They uh, recently bought Fantasy Records, which was the largest independent company up to a point. And um, they did the Ray Charles record a couple years ago that won all the Grammys. And uh, Nick's been working, there, working for them for quite a while. He started out, started out with them right out of college in the late 1980s. But he'll tell you more about that. Please welcome Nick Phillips. Thank you. Thanks for coming, buddy. So Nick, Nick and I have been in the jazz world together for a long time and served on some committees here and there. So, um, and I think, didn't you win a Grammy this past year? I produced a record that was nominated. There you go. It was nominated. It didn't win. You, they, you do that every year, though, don't you? Produce uh, a record that's nominated. Well, two years in a row. This last two years, I've been fortunate enough to have that happen. Not every year, but... How many Grammy nominations altogether have you got? Oh, uh, gosh. If you count... Uh, early assistant producer credits as well, somewhere in the neighborhood of eight or nine. That's pretty good. So well, let's talk about what you do for Concord. How do you get the job of being an A&R guy? Well, um, it didn't happen overnight. Um, when I was hired by Concord back in 1987, right out of college, there was no position. I was just happy to accept a Titleist Gopher job and um, started out by doing things like organizing the publicist's photo library, peeling stickers off of return CDs so that our warehouse could sell them again. Um, but all of those, even those kinds of mundane tasks, I felt were good learning opportunities because I quickly learned the artists in the catalog and the artists that were signed to the label. Um, about a year into working for the company, Carl Jefferson, the, the owner and founder of the company, invited me to join him uh, for a Carmen McRae recording he was producing. Uh, it was a live recording at a uh, now defunct club called uh, Birdland West. So that was my first opportunity to uh, work in a producing capacity. I was assistant producer on that recording. And um, shortly thereafter, we had started a solo piano series called uh, Live at Maybeck Recital Hall. Oh, yeah. And uh, he had turned me loose on the first of, of those recordings, which was a Joanne Brackeen recording, and I produced several of those, acting as either producer or, if he was present, um, associate producer on the recordings in that series. Um, but I, I came into it with a music background. I was a music major in college. I got my Bachelor of Music in a music business program at University of the Pacific. So I'm not sure how it's structured here, but that particular major um, included fulfilling all the requirements that any conservatory of music major would have to fulfill in terms of studying music. And additionally, there were courses from the School of Business and Public Administration and courses specifically geared to the music industry. What did you play? I'm a, a trumpet player. Really? Yeah. You still play? I do. For Not my... as much as I used to. <laughs> I, ma I made a brief cameo appearance on Karin Allison's last record, which was nominated for a Grammy. That's a very nice record. record. You played on that? Yeah, I played the uh, Harmon Mute Trumpet thing on Footprints. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> so, um, well, uh, tell me more about uh, your daily life at the, at the company. Now you're dealing with, with the production of records all the way through. That's your main job? Well, we, I'm, we have several A&R people in our company now. We've grown from a company of about 15 or 20 employees when I first started working at the company back in 87 to uh, around 160 employees. So, uh, so it's a lot much. of growth through acquisition. Like you mentioned earlier, we had acquired the fantasy company, uh, all of its masters, um, which includes such great jazz labels as Riverside, Prestige, Pablo, Contemporary, Milestone. And at the end of 2005, we acquired Telarc which, as you well know, is a great jazz, blues, and classical catalog with a, an active, ongoing recording program. Um, so my current role, my title is Vice President of Jazz and Catalog A&R, so I'm very specifically focused on jazz. Uh, that does include producing some of the new recording projects uh, or otherwise supervising them. There are some projects that I may act as more of an executive producer role, uh, that the artist will produce themselves or work with another producer. And on the catalog side, 
which is where I these days spend most of my time, is uh, working with our what is now a very large jazz catalog on uh, reissue programs. What is your mandate for that? Put out as many as you can, as fast as you can? Not exactly, uh, uh, although it seems like that, because um, last year I produced or otherwise supervised more than 50 projects that were released. And this year, it's probably going to be about the same number. But that isn't the directive now. Um, you know, as we've grown into a larger company, we also have investment partners. So we have to deal with uh, the issues that any corporation has to deal with in terms of showing a profit and doing a profit and loss analysis before you start a project, before you start incurring costs. So it's as many as we can that will be profitable oh, in the first year. And that's the, that's the benchmark is we're looking at a one year window. Well, how do you balance out the retail distribution world with the online world? What percentage, what's the relationship of those two? They both figure in your computations, right? They do figure into the computations. Um, still, the online world is only about 10% of what we sell, if even that. So still a good 85% is, is CDs, um, and another 5% or so with other means of, of income, like licensing and, and, and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a definitely a challenging environment right now, because although you, you read the news about uh, digital download business increasing, you say, 50% over last year at this time, or, or some number like that, the fact is it hasn't increased enough to offset the business we're losing in CD sales with major stores, major chains like Tower closing. Um, so you know, CD sales down are down overall about 20% compared to where they were last year. About 20% in one year? I thought it was like 20%. Oh, 20, it was about 20% of the first three, three months of the year compared to the first three months of last year. Really? It was down about 20%. Well, that's a big hit. I it thought it was hit. stretched over five years, but it's, you say it's in one year that's felt that much. Wow. But do you sell directly to accounts? Does Concord sell directly to Barnes and Noble? And the no, thing? we're uh, we're distributed now. We're distributed <coughs> worldwide by Universal Music Distribution, which oh, is one of the major distribution the, companies. Yeah. And um, Telarc is distributed through Fontana, which is. Uh, kind of the independent arm of universal distribution. Do you have any relationship to the, dis to the distribution arm to what Universal is doing? Or is that just, they just supply the records to the stores, they just ship them? To what Universal, uh, the distribution what, yeah. company is doing, doing in terms of what Well, like, do you, you get involved in the co-op advertising? You get involved Our in company does. I don't personally. Yeah. Um, my, my, my function is, is an A&R function, yeah. although I, I do get involved in sales and marketing to the extent that projects that I produce I have a vested interest in and right. I want to make sure that they're doing everything I think they can and should be doing to So when you have a product a project within the budget. Well if you have a product that's about finished, is that when you, you try to get the marketing people involved? Or does it have to be finished before they develop the plan? When do they come into the picture? They usually come into the picture uh, well they come into the picture even before a project project is recorded because the first part of it is doing the P&L process. And in order to do that, which is now an important, is an essential part of the process of a recording project, because if it doesn't pass the P&L process, you, you either don't get it green lighted or you have to convince the powers that be that there's a compelling reason to do this project, even though you're showing you're not going to make any money on it in the first year. So in that regard, sales and marketing is involved even before the project is recorded. You know, it would be a situation like I'll, I'll be working on developing the concept of a project and then I'll kind of pitch it to sales and marketing saying, say, this is what we're planning on doing. This is how the project, the artist's last project did. Uh, this is what's going on in terms of touring and other things. And they get back to me with what they think they can uh, ship and sell. <laughs> in a one-year period, how much they need to do that in terms of co-op dollars, how much our marketing department needs in terms of advertising, radio promotion, and all those other things. Who's the guy that gives the green light? 
Is that well, it's, it's a process. It's, it's actually, we have weekly P&L meetings, and we all sit down in a room, including the head of finance and the president of the company, Glenn Barrows, and we go through these projects, whatever project is on the agenda for that week. And if in going through that process it looks good, you get a green light and you move forward. I always solicit information in advance of going into that meeting so right. I have a good idea right. of whether it's looking like it's going right. to be a viable project. How many new records a year does Concord release? Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80. Whoa. Yeah. 80 new records? No, well, new including catalog releases. Okay. Uh, I mean, new, new releases. So new releases. Uh, we probably do 50 or probably a good 60 reissue compilation kinds of projects. And then another 20, 20 or so new recordings. Yeah. Do you do most of those? No. Who does them? John? John is our, our John Burke is our uh, head of A&R. So he's the head of the department. Right. And he produces some of them. Um, you know, independent producers, depending on the project, will get involved. Um, because we're much more than a jazz, just a jazz company now. Right. Well, jazz is my area of focus. But, um, you know, with the Ray Charles record and other records, like uh, th this new deal that we formed with Starbucks, a partnership with them to form the Hear Music label, we have a Paul McCartney record coming out. I heard about that. Yeah. How'd you get that So done? I'm not producing it. <laughs> You're not. <laughs> Too bad. That's a pretty amazing proposition, yeah. that Paul McCartney's going to make a record for Starbucks. Right. That's it cool. Is. Wow, different world. So tell me what you, when, you, when you're considering signing a new artist, mm -hmm. tell me about the process. What do you look for? Do you want somebody that's already got a fan base? Do somebody that's already got a tour set up? Somebody's already got a manager? Or how does it work? What's your criteria? The, yes. All those things? <laughs> uh, I, I look at it, at it as um, the record company just being one leg of a stool. You, know, you, you also need strong artist management. You need a strong booking agent. You need to have those other things in place. Um, that's not to say that we haven't in the past signed artists that we really felt were special and believed in and then worked to get those other pieces in place. But especially these days where it's so difficult to um, have your recording projects make sense financially given the current climate of the market. It's really important that um, an artist have an established fan base, that they have a touring schedule, that they have solid and competent management. Because um, there's enough for us to do as a record company without having to deal with those other things not being in place. Who, who have you signed recently that has those things in place in the last six months? I mean, can in you name an artist? Six months? Well, Angie Stone on the Stax label. This is us as a company. I'm not talking about me personally. Um, so they, they, they've resuscitated Stax as a, as yes. a viable trade? Yes. Stax is one of the labels that uh, Fantasy owned. <coughs> Fantasy right. had acquired prior, some years prior to our acquiring Fantasy. Uh, and this year is the 50th anniversary of Stax, so... Must be some celebrations going on. There's a lot going on, yeah. So you're going to release a lot of, new, a lot of the old Stax catalog? Yes. Like what? Otis? A bunch of, a lot of best ofs, Otis Redding, uh, Johnny Taylor, um, Carla Thomas, Rufus Thomas, you, you name it. There's yeah. something going on uh, with, with those artists. Isaac Hayes. Booker T. Booker T and EMGs, yeah. They had everybody, didn't they? They sure did. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so do you, are you actually going through the vaults, all those, those old vaults of fantasy and looking through all the, the, the tapes and and the, the files. I mean, you must have a, a room. Is it all computerized now? It is computerized, but uh, that needs improvement. It's an old database. Right. Um, and because we've also got the Concord labels right. and now the Telarc labels, we're looking to get all of those masters in a database that we can easily use. But, yeah, whenever... Take, take, for example, the Rudy Van Gelder Remaster series that we're doing. We're releasing 15 of those this year. And the concept is Rudy Van Gelder, the original recording engineer, remasters them. Um, I hire someone to write new liner notes, and we reissue them. Blue Note did that. Blue Note did that first, yeah. yeah. So we're doing that now, too. Did and that work? 
Is that a good marketing device? People yeah. care? People do care, actually. It's, it, it's, you know, the, the idea of putting old wine into a new bottle, it does work. Hmm. Um, you do sell significantly more of a new reissue that you put out there again and you make a splash with than if you just leave it sitting in the catalog. What's a good number for a reissue? 10,000 units? 10's great. 10's good, yeah. Um, you know, some of these jazz, if, if you can get 5,000 units out there uh, in the U.S., you're doing fine. So it's worthwhile to do it at 5,000? Yes, but you've got to control the costs <coughs> in other think, areas. Yeah. It's, it's, in that way, it's easier to make a reissue work in terms of getting the green light because you can show a profit in the first year if you keep your other costs down. Whereas a new recording, you have all these recording expenses that you have to contemplate right. and deal with. Whereas when you're dealing with a reissue, those have long since been written right. off. What percentage of your business is outside of the U.S.? Half? No, it's not quite half. It's maybe 35%. Including Japan and Europe, it's such a big both jazz markets, but they can't add up to the U.S.? No, they don't. Interesting. Um, we're hoping and planning for that to be better with the switch to universal distribution worldwide, but it's still less than the U.S. The U.S. is still the best. The outsells the rest of the world, <coughs> even with all the problems we're having. Right. So um, do you, what is your expectations? I mean, what, you, the company must be having some strategic conversations about the future. What, what does it look like for you guys? I mean, is the future in cell, tone, cell tones or spring tones, or is the future in making music? It's well, I wouldn't question. say for a company like us, the future is ringtones. Um, it's a little piece of it, but um, we're really an adult music-oriented company. That's, that's what our catalog represents for the most part, and that's how we go about um, recording and releasing and marketing new artists. We're not going for the latest teen hit. Um, so... Well, that's just the 1960s. Yeah. Paul McCartney. <laughs> So you probably well, those people aren't te those things aren't <laughs> well, teens true. anymore. You're going to expand though, right? I mean, you're not going to just stay in that adult market, are you? Well, that's our focus. That's our focus. Well, not, when I say adult, that that covers a variety of genres. Well, stacks, R and B. Yeah. Well, you don't you don't depend on radio play to sell your records, right? It's a component. It depends on on the project. Some of these R&B projects are, you know, radio is an important component. Jazz projects, jazz radio is not a very significant uh, marketing component in terms of what it does of its own volition to generate CD sales. But it's that in combination with other things working in synergy that um, makes jazz radio important. So what also, you, you know, as a story to tell, when you have a number one jazz record at jazz radio, it may not be in of itself stimulating a whole lot in the, in the way of sales, but the artist booking agent can say, right. we've got the number one jazz record right. and, and all these other things that you can use that piece uh, to communicate the story of success helps market the record. What, what, do you all sit around and figure out what you think may happen in five years where the business is going? We're trying to. <laughs> where, where, what are you, what's your conclusion? Where is it going? Is it all the internet? Well, I, I don't think it's ever going to be all the internet. I, I think at some, maybe 10 years from now, it'll be predominantly internet, and CDs will still be a niche in the same way that, well, or maybe not in the same way, but you know, there's still a, a niche LP market. Um, but currently, it has that, that business hasn't increased fast enough to offset what we're losing in CDs. I think that's ultimately where it may be going. It, that seems to be the writing on the wall. Right. But it's not there yet. So uh, that's, that's the challenge we face right now, is we can see what the future might look like, but it's, it's not here yet. Right. What about value added to your CD? Do you make get video, or do you add? Any, what what do you do you think in terms of value added for the product? Yeah, well, certainly uh, 
in terms of the reissues that we work on, wherever I can find an unreleased track, previously unissued track that's of high quality, I like to include it in the context of it having been recorded in the context of the rest of the material that's on a particular record. Uh, in terms of video, that that can be a, a nice value added. The problem is the costs associated with video often make it cost prohibitive. So it really kind of it comes down to what the project is, what we think this other component will actually generate in terms of additional sales, and is it really uh, worth doing? Does it make sense to do that? Do you have a YouTube channel? Do you have a MySpace account? I mean, how do you participate in any of those things? Yeah, in fact, we have uh, a guy who just focuses on what we call new, new media, media, all the new media stuff, uh, maintaining our MySpace page, um, you know, getting online editorial at the various digital download sites for our releases, um, that kind of stuff. Hmm. So we're, we're, we're definitely um, doing everything we can to maximize the opportunities in the digital world. It's not like that's, it's not like that's something that we're ignoring. Right. Um, so we who recognize the value in that. Who takes care of the Starbucks account? Is that, I mean, are you supplying them with a steady stream of product? Or you, do you meet with those people and de determine ideas of things that you want to do? Or how does that work? Well, in terms of going forward with the, with the Hear Music label, which that label is formed in partnership with Concord and Starbucks. So you own part of it? Yes. So, and the Paul McCartney recording will be the first release on that label. Of course, the obvious advantage of that is anything that comes out on the, that new Hear Music label gets distribution in Starbucks stores. And um, the, the success of the Ray Charles record really demonstrated the value in that. How many records did they sell I mean, for you guys through, through the stores? Well, it depends on the project. I mean, oh, Ray Charles. The Ray Charles did over eight million worldwide. Eight million. Not not just through Starbucks. But still. But that's as I understand it, the deal was set up so that they had guaranteed that they would take two hundred thousand in to start. And I, I'm not even sure what they're up to now, but um, it's well beyond that. But the thing is that the, in addition to the sales at Starbucks stores, the, the awareness that it generates, even if people don't necessarily pick it up there, they go into Starbucks every day to get their latte. People aren't walking into Borders every day or Barnes & Noble every day or any other CD retailer every day or even visiting Amazon every day, but you do have people walking into Starbucks every single day. So um, the repeat impressions that you get mm -hmm. from that kind of placement Phenomenal. It's you just don't you just don't have that kind of saturation at any other retail outlet that, what, that we deal what, with. What about your price points? I mean, are you selling your reissues for a midline price? What, yes. What is the retail price of an average reissue for you? Average reissue is eleven ninety eight. So they end up being sold for what in the stores? It depends on if it's in if it's in a sales program, <clears throat> it'll be down to like nine ninety eight. Mm -hmm. um, some retailers may mark it up a little. Some may sell it at twelve ninety eight. We can only suggest what uh, the list price is. It's up to them to to price yeah, right. it. Well, how do you how do you deal with the fact of so many record stores closing? I mean, if you lost Tower, you lost a major account, right? I mean, so you said dwindling number of possibilities here. This is not terrifying to the company in some sense. <laughs> <laughs> how are they going to deal? Terrifying, I. I it's unsettling, to say the least. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. Um, Tower was a very important account for us and any other company like us that has a deep catalog. You're right. Uh, because... You can't sell it in Walmart. Yeah. You, Walmart, Best Buy, they're, they're not going to stock your deep catalog. Tower would. And since we have such a big catalog, they were a very important retailer for right. us. So... But there's not that many accounts you can sell to, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's Barnes & Noble, there's Borders. And Borders, those are the main ones. And Amazon, of course. <coughs> I mean, you, get, you have to look at Amazon as an account. Because um, more and more people are acquiring their music 
that way, just going online and buying the CD, if not downloading it. So they buy it for the same price a record store would buy it, or a distributor would buy it? They, they get it from our distributor just like any store. Oh, really? So they're considered a retail account just like Borders is, just like Barnes & Noble is. So they acquire our product through universal distribution. So when you, what, not all of your records are going to go into Borders. Ray Charles went in there, right? Mm -hmm. So what kind of, do you have to, you pay for the listing stations, you pay for the end caps. I mean, does it, co it cost money to put these records in the stores or they just want them because they know they're going to sell it? Yes. I, it's not your department? No. Well, it, we do, Borders is, is an important account for us. Um, and they do typically stock our new releases across the board, but if to get any significant quantities in there, you do need to participate in retail co-op programs such as listening stations, end cap placement, and all of that stuff, like you said, costs money. They don't, they don't typically do that for free. No. What about the radio? Do you, do you have your own in-house promotion people or do you hire that out, do you hire people to do it? It's that? both. We have um, an in-house staff and they quarterback and oversee independents that we hire. What's, what's the gross of, of Concord at this stage of the game? How much money do they make? Is that a secret? Yeah. <laughs> We're not a publicly we're not a public company. So, so oh, understand. that's right. Why don't you tell tell the, the 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 ladies and gentlemen who is the primary? Some of them may know this name. Our majority shareholder is is a company called Act Three Communications, and that's uh, Hal Gaba and Norman Lear's company. Y'all know Norman Lear? Norman Lear, the television producer. He made his kind of fortune, I guess, in the seventies, right? Right. Um, all of the family. Uh, and all those th shows that spun off from that. Didn't Jefferson, he had the Jefferson kinds of different yeah. shows. So is he still active in the TV world? He did, didn't he just do the movie, the what was the Happy Feet movie? Wasn't that his movie? Yeah, he was involved with that. That was Village Roadshow, right? Yeah, yeah. So when you, I mean, the man that owned your company, that owned Fantasy, was Saul Zantz, and he did movie production. He did One Flew with the Cuckoo's Nest, and right, and Amadeus. Yeah. And, um, number of big hits, Charity Fire, Charity Fire, or something. Uh, there was some other big movie that they were working on. So what happened to all that? Did, is Saul out of the picture altogether? Saul Zantz, well, Saul Zantz was the primary owner of Fantasy, right. and also Ralph Caffel, who right. uh, Ralph Caffel was the one who really ran the record division. Right. Um, so when we acquired Fantasy at the end of 2004, we acquired the master tapes in terms of the recordings, the publishing companies, and we acquired Fantasy Studios. Saul Zanz kept his film companies. Right. We didn't acquire uh, the film companies, and we didn't acquire actually the building that we're in. Really? Right. So we're, we're leasing space that in that right? building. And, and is Ralph still running the company? No. So who's there in Berkeley that's running that company? Well, I'm I'm in the Berkeley office. I mean, Glenn Barrows is running the company. From from, but in he's in words, LA, right? In other words, it's all part of Concord Music right. Group, and Glenn Barrows is the president of Concord Music right. Group. Right. Uh, we still have a staff in Berkeley, and uh, and as well as the studios and the staff that goes with the studios. Right. Um, I'm based in the Berkeley office, even though I've been a longtime employee of Concord, not Fantasy per se, but. Um, I'm, I was Bay Area based before we acquired Fantasy, oh, yeah. so I conveniently moved into the Fantasy building after that happened. So, well, let's go back to your area of, of focus. Uh, you're, you're probably in the process of signing some artists, right? Do these, these people come, come to you or you find them, or is it managers or lawyers? I mean, how does this all, how does it usually work, or is there a typical way? Well, in the past, we were a little a little more passive about it. We would typically wait for the artists to come us, come to us. Really? Um, but over the last, of course, about the last year, we've been more proactive in terms of reaching out to artists and managers that we're interested in, regardless of whether they may be signed to a to a company currently or not. But just letting them know, hey, you know, we're we're interested in you. We we love what you do, and if you're ever free and looking for another place to call home, you know, give us some consideration. Um, 
And we get, of course, like any record company, we get a lot of material sent to us unsolicited. Um, do you listen to it? When I can, when I can. I do listen to everything, but not quickly usually because I yeah. have too many real priorities and things I have to get done as part of my job. So um, because that's not typically the way we even sign an artist. Um, When's the last time you got a record through the mail that you signed? I can't even remember the last time. Doesn't usually happen, does it? No, it's, it's, it's and also at least in jazz, um, it's so rare to have somebody come completely from out of nowhere. They've usually done some kind of right. apprenticeship, if you will, with other jazz players, um, and you become aware of them as a side artist first. And so, yeah, that's really kind of um, an antiquated way of yeah. finding talent. It really, it really is not the way it's done anymore. Well, yeah, the, we still get lots and lots yeah, of demo tapes. People are not going to give up on demo that. CDs now. Uh, are you? Um, do you? Jazz is considered an art form. Do you? Could, do you? Do you feel like an obligation to that art form in your work that you're trying to look for how to advance the art form? Do you think this way? I do. Yeah, I, I personally I do because that's that is my area of passion. Um, that's really why I got into the business. Um, I feel fortunate that I've been able to get to a point in my career where that is my primary focus mm -hmm. in terms of my day-to-day -day dealings. And um, I think it's vitally important. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't do it, I don't know who's going to do it, because there's only like three or four of you guys, right? <laughs> um, so well, let's go back to your, to your, your initial entry into the music business. Talk about what it is to be uh, on that level, because you didn't come in with some vice president of marketing or something, you came in on the lowest level, right? Right. How did that work and how long did it take you to get to a point of, of um, you know, responsibility where you had day-to-day -day responsibility? And how, do you con how did you convince your bosses that they should stick with you? Well, my, my career has been one of zigzagging my way up, really. Um, I've been with Concord for my whole career. Like I said, I, I landed the job at Concord right out of college, and I've been with the company ever since. So I'm in my 20th year now. That's incredible. Um, fortunately, along the way, Carl Jefferson, the original owner and founder of the company, gave me opportunities to get my feet wet in terms of A&R and producing, even though that wasn't a part of my primary responsibility. Um, so I started as a gopher. I was promoted to inventory and purchasing manager. Now, that may not seem like a glamorous job, and it certainly wasn't, but the great thing about that was I really learned our catalog and our artists um, by doing that. And at the same time, I would always make a point every day to listen to something new in our catalog that I hadn't heard. So I was, one of the great things about working at a record company is you can listen to music while you work. And so uh, I felt it was important to take advantage of that. Um, I was then promoted to director of publicity, and really, mm -hmm, and and this was back at a time when we were almost exclusively a jazz record company. Right. A few things in classical. So, and then um, then we were acquired by um, a company called Alliance Entertainment Corporation, and that's where Glenn Barrows came on right. into the picture because he was. Uh, working for Alliance in terms of acquiring content, in other words, companies and record companies that they could distribute through their distribution pipeline. And so when Glenn came on board, um, Carl Jefferson sold the company. Um, Glenn was the guy that brokered the deal between Concord and Alliance. And only a couple months after selling the company, Carl Jefferson uh, right. died of liver cancer. So Glenn Barrows came on board as president of Concord at that time. And then shortly thereafter, he promoted me to director of marketing, which was uh, overseeing all the marketing areas, publicity, radio, um, advertising. That's the key spot there, bud. Right. 
And at, and at that time, that was the senior marketing position because we were a smaller company. There was only one vice president at the company at that time. That was John Burke. Um, but still, again, although it wasn't a part of my title and my primary responsibilities, I was also producing records. Um, like I mentioned, the Maybeck series, different other opportunities to, to produce new artists' recordings. Well, what did you learn about marketing? I mean, how did you know about marketing? Just reading about it? Just picking it up through osmosis? I mean, did you have it in college? I learned by doing. I just really learned by doing, yeah, and reading. But um, as, as director of marketing, I was responsible for um, developing and implementing marketing plans for all of our releases. That, that's a big deal. It's no small job. Yeah. Yeah, so. Um, Who's got the job now? Well, now we have a much larger marketing department. And um, we have a senior VP of marketing named Margie Chesky. We have a VP of radio promotion um, named. So, so, so it's Glenn. Glenn Barris is at the top. And then he has these managers underneath him. Like mm -hmm. there's somebody at A&R marketing promotion. It, it, Glenn. Well, there's even a guy above Glenn. I mean, Hal Gabe is the chairman of the board, but Glenn is the president of right. the company. And um, reporting to Glenn are Gene Rumsey, who's our general manager. Right. Uh, John and John Burke, who is the head of executive VP and chief creative officer. So John Burke is the head of the A and R department. Right. And then you have all the department heads underneath those guys. Right. And then they have their their staff. Right. That's where you get the 160 people. Well, and you also get that because we have uh, Telarc oh, and, and, and Fantas. We have the employees from, from those companies. And there have been various degrees of consolidating um, positions. But for the most part, Telarc functions as its own independent A&R and production center. And I say independent, I mean there's definitely communication, but it's its own standing A&R and production center as well. So they, they're given a budget, probably at the beginning of the year or at some point, and that's what they have to spend on A&R for that year. And then they consult with you or somebody at the company, probably Glenn, about what they're going to do with that money? Something like that. I mean, there is a budgeting and planning process that happens for every year and you project uh, what you expect your division to be able to do. What's the thing that you think that the, the fantasy needs to get, I mean, the Concord needs to get better at? What's the thing that, you know, everybody's saying we got to do better at that? Is there one thing that you're just trying to focus on and make it work better? Well, I would say internally it's communication because we've grown so quickly over the last couple of years in terms of growth by acquisition so Concord Music Group is now comprised of three different entities that we're trying to, uh, to run under <coughs> one corporate umbrella. And so while the, again, while the focus and attention was on growth by acquisition, now I think it's vitally important that we focus on uh, bettering communication um, in our company, and especially since you have companies that represent three different co corporate cultures and three different ways of doing things. That's, yeah. that's a challenge and an important thing that we need to address. Interesting. Well, um, if somebody, do, do, does Concord take interns? We do. How does one go about, uh, is there a website or you call someone on the phone or how does it work? Call HR? Uh, usually it's HR. Um, we also have a lady named Rebecca Deshpande that coordinates our internship program and she's in our Los Angeles office. How many people do you take? Um, you she probably takes 10 or so at a time. I see. And, and the way she has it set up is uh, typically they get to rotate departments. So they'll spend two or three weeks in A&R and maybe two or three weeks in marketing. And, what a great deal. Yeah. Well, what kind of advice would you have to, to some of these people here that want to go into this business and maybe even working for one of those internships? What would you tell them? What to look, what, what's the thing they should be most aware of, they should be most careful about, most focused on? Well, I would say, and this is just based on my own experience of how I started out, which was a job without a title, and it was really a gopher job just doing whatever anyone wanted me to do, is to really do that in, 
not only enthusiastically, but to really, even in the most mundane tasks, try to uh, see what you can learn from that and how you can use that to, um, to your advantage in terms of ascending in your career in the music industry. What, is the, what are the people that the, the boss is going to be looking for in a young intern? Enthusiasm, conscientious, thoroughness, what? All of those things. I um, think uh, also the ability to think things through and, and make decisions. I think it's important for an intern or an entry-level position person or anyone in a company, if you're going to your superior, whoever that may be, your boss, maybe it's the person overseeing you in the internship. If you have a problem or a question or an issue, come, come with some answers of your own, some potential answers of your own that show that you are thinking the situation through and that you're not just looking to someone else to, to provide the answers for you, but that you are doing the work to, to get the answers yourself. Being proactive in terms of solutions to problems. Is this a nine to five gig? Oh. <laughs> No, my, <laughs> on a day when I, when I don't have anything other than going into the office and doing my desk work, I'm usually in the office from 10 to 12 hours a day, usually 10. I mean, I usually get in at 9 and go home at 7, plus my commute. You, That's just a normal day. Mm. Okay. And the weekends, you're out listening to music? Listen, yeah, well, then that, that, that doesn't include the evenings that you're going out and hearing music uh, or the weekends or the time when you are working on a recording project. As you well know, those are very long days, and they include weekends and late nights, and you do whatever you need to do to get the, the job done. What's your role as a producer? How do you see yourself? I mean, because as a jazz producer myself, sometimes you can have more of you can have more to say than other times. Yeah, and that, that's a good point, because it, it really depends on the artists and what their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, some artists may need more help and guidance in terms of planning the record before you get into the studio, in terms of what's the concept, or is there a concept, what's the repertoire, who are the best musicians for this project. Um, and in other cases, the artist may have a very clear vision of what they want to do, and it's just a matter of doing everything you can help you can do to help uh, make everything go smoothly and taking care of the logistics that, that, that they may not want to take care of themselves. And really importantly, being a, a, a pair of objective ears in the studio. Um, I think it's there's a natural tendency for any artist or any musician to kind of focus mostly on what they're doing and what their thing is, what they sound like in a particular context. As a producer, I look at it at my role as being a more global view. Uh, how does it sound, not only musically but sonically, not just the leader but you know the side artist? Um, how's the balance? How is you know is it really a great take? It may be a great take by the lead artist, but if one or the other of the assignment, maybe you're not playing up to their best. So um, just really, really guiding the whole process with objective ears, I think, is important. Do you do all your recording at Fantasy Studios? Not all of it, but um, some of it. Uh, the Nina Freelon project I did a couple years ago, we did the whole thing at Fantasy, recorded, mixed, and mastered. Um, Karin Allison's last record we recorded in New York because Karin's based in New York and the musicians she was, she was using on the project are based in New York, so it made better economic sense to just fly me to New York than to fly everyone else out to course, Berkeley. Yeah. Um, but, so we recorded in New York and then we did some vocal re-recording in Berkeley and mixed and mastered in Berkeley on that particular project. Do you have an engineer that you work with almost all the time? Well, in New York, I, I like to work with Josiah Gluck. I've been working with him for several years now. Um, he's also uh, one of the house engineers at Saturday Night Live. Right. Um, and um, he was the, uh, speaking of Karen Allison, her breakout album, Ballads Remembering John Coltrane from uh, 2001, 
got two Grammy nominations, one for Best Jazz Vocal Album and one for Best Engineered Recording Non-Classical, which is a category that encompasses all genres outside of classical, and Josiah engineered that one. So really? It's you know, a pretty remarkable achievement, I think, for an engineer to get nominated for a jazz record in right. that category. Okay. So he's, he's a terrific engineer, and I like so, to work with him whenever I can. I mean, I have my favorite engineer, too, but how do you, what, what is that relationship? I mean, that's a very key relationship, right? Where you can work with somebody and they can almost read your mind. Do you have that with him? Yeah, in, in, in some respects. I mean, there, a lot of times we'll be uh, working on a mix or whatever, and he'll do something and, and I'll acknowledge it, you know, because we're thinking exactly the same, same thing at a, at a certain time. Um, I think it's also important to uh, work with somebody that you, you mesh with personally because, uh, it, you know, this stuff should be fun, too. It shouldn't be work. It should be fun. This should be the stuff that really is the soul-enriching stuff and, and the stuff that makes um, putting up with everything else worthwhile because you get to do this. So for me, it's not just the talent of the person, but it's also who they are as a human being I think is important when you're working, spending so many hours together in a studio. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that um, <clears throat> there aren't times when you have to work with difficult people, and that's, I think, also part of being a good producer is having the people skills to deal with difficult situations and uh, to, to diffuse difficult situations, to diffuse problems rather than exacerbate them. Yeah. Dan? Um, on that subject, how do you go about diffusing a problem when you're in the studio, trying to get the best performance you can out of the artist? Like, do you have a specific method? Do you like to be in the live room with him or in the control room? Like, how do you go about fixing a problem when an artist just, they just can't seem to get it? How do you go about something like that? Yeah, it, it, it depends on what the problem is. Sometimes it's just a matter of recognizing that the artist is tired and maybe you need a 15, 20 minute break and suggest, you know, the artist go outside and take a walk and clear their head. Um, I think also, wherever possible, and invariably when you're at a, you know, all the planning in the world, there are, there are going to be things that come up in a recording session that you don't expect or you don't plan for. Um, little technical problems that can happen in even the best studios that may uh, cause a delay in the, the flow of recording. Um, Do you ever fire a musician? I've never fired a musician at the session, no. Have you? You get it right the first time? Have you? <laughs> a couple of times. <laughs> That's, you know, if you don't get it right when it, going into it, you got to get it right while you're there. I mean, you get it yeah. there's no, no reason to wait. But, uh, yeah, it happens sometimes. But. Well, I, you know, one, one instance, I was, I was working on this, um, producing a recording for Jazz Times Magazine's 30th anniversary. It's called the Jazz Times Super Band, and it featured Bob Berg and Randy Brecker, uh, Joey DeFrancesco, and Dennis Chambers. And... They were doing uh, Freedom Jazz Dance. And they, they were playing a, just an amazing take. And the, we were recording analog, and the 24-track analog machine just went out. It just died on us in the middle of the take. Mm. So I didn't, I didn't want to stop them while they were, because oh. we were, you know. But I let them finish, and they walk in their room. Oh. And, Let's hear that back. And I had to break the news to them. And again, in a situation like that, I think it's important to, to be calm, be positive. You know, so what else can you do? You, know, you just try to encourage a positive environment and while the engineers are working on fixing the problem. But fortunately, they came back and did another take that was even better. So. Well, that helped. <laughs> so do you record analog even today? Not very often. We mostly record digital. Pro Tools HD a, a lot of times. Right. It's just so much more convenient. The costs are lower. Um, it's much easier to work with in terms of editing and mixing. Sometimes we would um, have done this in a few years, but record on Pro Tools, then mix to a to a half inch tape. Do you do that? 
30 I've, years. I've, I've heard of some engineers like, I don't do that myself as a producer. It's not like something I would insist on doing. Mm -hmm. But Do you have anything, do you help pick out the mics? Do you, uh, how far in depth do you go with it? I let the engineer do that, and the only time I jump in is if it's not sounding right to yeah. me. I'm not going to say, hey, use this mic on this, no. this person. Um, if you hire a good engineer, you expect that they're going to do their right. job. Right. And there have been some instances where I said, that may be a great mic, but it's not the right mic for this vocalist. This is not how her voice should sound. Mm -hmm. And you try some other things till you get there. You said earlier that uh, when, you're, when you're producing, um, you sit there and you try to listen with an objective ear. Can you tell me what an objective ear is? What I mean by that is um, typically each, each musician on the project, even though you're hearing everything, when, when they're listening to a playback, they're kind of more focusing on their role and their, what, what they're playing. And um, when I say an objective ear, listening to the whole take as a complete entity, also listening sonically, does it, you know, it may be a great performance, but are there, are there any problems with how it was recorded or how it's being recorded that we need to adjust? So all of these things I, I'm, I'm listening for is, you know, is a musician out of tune over here or somebody do something over there that detracts from what the singer's doing, all, all of those kinds of things. Okay. I mean, it's not entirely objective. It's, <laughs> it's also going through my own subjective filter, too. But um, I like to think that the, the, the subjective filter of a producer is a little more objective than any other individual, perhaps, in, in the recording process. I kind of liken it to being the first audience. And you mm -hmm. get to hear it first. And you get to be, you can just respond to it. Does this give me goosebumps? Do I like this? Right. What do I think? And then you can open your eyes and actually try to do something about it. <laughs> Pretty cool. Well, I think it's uh, it's about time to go. So thank Nick Phillips for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.